Hello guys and welcome back to the channel. So in today's video, um, we're going to be discussing organ donation. Okay, so this is one of medicine's most complex and impactful fields, right? So the idea of taking organs from someone, um, whether that be due to the situational circumstance that they're in and helping to save, extend and prolong another person's life. Um, and so therefore, this is quite a complicated topic and there's quite a bit to discuss. And specifically, we're going to be talking about organ donation in 2025 and why it's of relevance right now. Because you could say that it's almost at crossroads. The need is higher than ever. As of October 2025, there are more than 8,000 people waiting for a life-saving transplant. And among them, over 250 of them are children with urgent um, and often extremely rare medical conditions. And despite the UK's opt-out system, so what that means is that everyone is automatically registered to be an organ donor unless you actively choose to say no so that's an opt-out system so you have to opt to say no so you have to opt out of the system whereas an opt-in system is where you have to say yes in order to be considered whereas here everyone is considered unless they specifically say they don't want to be an organ donor so despite this opt-out system that we have and i think that there's over 25 28 million people who have uh, who are on the organ donor uh, organ donor register uh, donation rates have plateaued and um, I think one of the difficulties uh, behind all this is consent and the difficulties behind clear communication. So um, let's talk about kind of what happens in regards to the kind of this pathway and um, and how things go essentially. So um, first of all, like I mentioned, there has been a drop in organ donors. I believe it's somewhere around 8%. And I guess that that's been something um, to have a think about because obviously 8% is quite a drastic um, number. And so it, it might, um, it's always important for the government and for health services to have a think about why that might be, what might be the exacerbating and the propagating factors behind these ideas. So first of all, um, I thought I could talk you guys through perhaps the organ donation pathway. So first of all, um, donor identification begins with clinical staff recognising that a patient's medical circumstances meets the criteria for a donor. So that's perhaps like a catastrophic brain injury or, you know, when people have accidents and, um, you know, they have catastrophic strokes or, um, you know, it's when death occurs in such a way um, which allows organ donation to be a possibility. And most of the time it is unfortunate um, traffic accidents, for example. OK, so that's where the, the medical assessment kind of um, comes into it. And unfortunately, only about 1% of UK deaths actually occur in such a way that allows organ donation, meaning that every potential donor is precious. Secondly, um, you know, you normally involve someone called an, a specialist nurse in organ donation, um, and it's their job to assess the individual's medical suitability. So that means testing for infections, ruling out malignancy, as well as importantly, doing tissue typing and blood group analysis. So um, these are some very, very important things to understand. So blood grouping um, is one of the main things um, that we match for. So ABO as well as RH positive or negative. And I will do another video on this at some point, um, which will explain this in a lot more detail. And so, you know, it's important um, to anticipate compatibility because we can't just put anyone's organs in anyone. The idea is our body has natural um, self-defense systems, which is the immune system. And the immune system can recognize the difference between um, foreign versus uh kind of innate um, host organs. And so some people have similar immune systems, you could say, you could argue in terms of this whole blood grouping, they have similar blood um, uh, tissue typing. And so therefore, it's it's okay. And for these people to exchange organs between each other, but for example, someone um, who has opposing um, kind of uh, tissue typing or opposing blood grouping systems um, would would not be able to exchange organs because what would happen is as soon as the organ is transplanted, the body would attack itself. It would attack the organ um, and therefore lead to even more problems. So I guess one of the main things that's really, really important um, behind this whole um, donor and um, referral idea is this central thing. And the reason why, and that's why it's in the middle, why it's so important is, so this is the, the family discussion, right? So the donor family authorization. Often at times, you know, it, it might not even be up to the donor themselves if they want to go ahead with this donation because obviously they'll be in such a critical state. And yes, they may have not chosen to opt out, um, but the family still does have a say in it. Um, and so the specialist nurse will approach the family, explain the process, try and understand their beliefs and handle any emotional or ethical concerns. And even under presumed consent, families are given the opportunity to discuss, support, or sometimes even override their loved one's wishes. So I believe last year there were 173 instances 
where um, families over overrode their loved ones' wishes in terms of organ, organ donations. So the do- the donors, the, the people who had unfortunately passed away, had said, uh, you know, they had chosen to not opt out. But um, following death, um, their families were unable, uh, did not consent to this. And so if the family does agree uh, and consent is confirmed, um, then the operating teams will prepare for organ retrieval. Um, so this is very, very time sensitive because obviously once you die, you know, your bodily functions are um, kind of depleting, you know, your your organs, they are... Uh, they need to be kept in such conditions so to um, make sure that they still maintain function. And so organs are often perfused with special fluids and transported into very, very cold storage protocols, which is important. So um, just as to give you an example of just how time sensitive they are. So heart and lungs must be transplanted within four to six hours. Livers, 12 hours. Kidneys within 36. So this rapid coordinated response um, of teams across the NHS basically defines whether a transplant can take place or not. And one of the challenges, which we'll come on to see later, is about whether there are um, reliable hospitals available where these transplants can take place, because not every hospital is able to perform transplants. And so then at this stage, organs are allocated um, via the NHS Blood and Transplants National Matching System. Um, And that's where the next bit comes in, which is our organ matching criteria triangle. So the idea behind this is that obviously there are some factors that we have to consider. So obviously compatibility, really, really important. Um, you know, blood grouping, HLA tissue types, um, the donor, donor recipient size, age, uh, all of these things are, are important to think about. And of course, the main thing kind of restricting compatibility will be blood grouping um, and HLA tissue types, which you don't have to know too much about, but blood, blood, blood grouping is the main one. The other things that are also important is urgency. So medical need is always at the forefront. So if you have, um, you know, if you have, if there's a patient who can survive, you know, um, via medical treatment, yes, they might need an organ, but they can survive via the hospital for another five years, as opposed to someone who is going to die within the next two months if they don't get this organ, then they're going to probably most likely end up giving it to the person who um, who's going to need it over, uh, within the next two months essentially obviously there are other factors to consider as well um such as age and and things called qualies which are quality adjusted life years so if the person who has only two months left to live is 85 and the other one is potentially a child you know that's where we have to weigh in these factors you can see it's not necessarily a, a clear and easy decision to make and the last thing is of course logistics as well so if you have an individual who lives all the way up in scotland but the organ that you have right now is in portsmouth and you know, it's looking like it's not viable to move transport wise or arrive at a hospital in time, especially if we're dealing with heart and lungs, then it's not going to be, um, yeah, it's probably going to be unlikely that this um, organ will go to the, uh, in the, the recipient in Scotland, for example. So viability windows and transport constraints are critical. And then, of course, finally, we will have um, transplantation of the organ as well. Um, and so the new recipient will then, and obviously they'll undergo a lot more testing, they'll spend weeks in hospital, post-operatively monitoring them, and um, planning immunosuppression, um, so the graft is, is as successful as possible. And so that's basically the, the main idea behind um, the organ donation pathway as such. And so if you just go back a second, you can see there's a lot of interplay and things go back and forwards, um, there's a lot of conversations, and it's not necessarily just one straight path, which is important to think about. Okay. So let's have a think about some of the ethical and systemic um, challenges. So despite so much scientific progress and robust protocols, you know, why do we have, why have we had an 8% drop, for example, um, in uh, the uh, organ donation, in organ donation? So the opt-out law presumes willingness, but surveys have shown that families are much more likely to agree and less likely to refuse if they know their relative's wishes in advance. So one of the things there is it potentially talks about, um, you know, the importance of, um, you know, speaking and conversing with families. So I think one of the things that's difficult, and I'll talk about this in the, in, in the conclusion, is that, as it says there, so if the family knows much more, if they know their relative's wishes in advance, they're much more likely to agree with them and less likely to refuse. So if the, family says, if the donor says, you know what, you know, please make sure that um, I, I'm happy for um, my organs to uh, be donated if necessary, then the family's probably going to be unlikely to um, revert that decision. Whereas perhaps if that conversation isn't had, then families might be more likely to. And so this is a difficult thing to, um, to of course, converse with anyone about. Um, but I think it's one of those things where if each, you know, in my last video, I talked about how can 
us as individuals actually have an impact on such a global system such as the NHS, such a you know national system such as the NHS. And I think one of these is, you know, little things like this, having these conversations, which can be very difficult to have. I totally appreciate that. But they are there are ways these are the ways in which we can help. So um qualities and considerations. So of course I've got the four um uh, the four kind of pillars of medical ethics, which I discussed in a video prior. If you haven't seen that one, I would really recommend you guys check it out. But, you know, these are all things to think about um, when it comes to making such a large decision um, such as this. And um, this can be not only from a, you know, a doctor's perspective when they're trying to um, speak with the family, but also maybe the family's perspective as well, you know. But put yourself in, in those shoes. Imagine if it was you um, on the other side, not necessarily on the doctor's side, but on the patient's side, you know, having to think about whether you'd want um, one of your relatives to have their organs donated, where you, whether you'd be happy for that, etc. So I guess, um, you know, based on these ideas, um, consent, so respect for autonomy. So consent should always reflect informed personal decisions. Um, so, you know, whilst we have the this opt-out system, that's a default status. It's not always the same as a real agreement. So we've got to really make sure that we have their consent to be able to donate. Um, beneficence, so the moral drive to do good. So one donor can help save up to nine recipients, um, sometimes across multiple organ types as well, which can massively save and transform lives. Obviously, that's probably the upper end of things, up to nine recipients. It's probably often only one or two, but still, I say one or two, like that's a small thing. That's incredible. Um, and, you know, that can give, you know, that think, and I think often when we think about um, lives saved, we only think about the individual who receives the organ. But if you think about, you know, think about the impact that has on their friends, the impact that has on their families, um, on their future families, on their future generations. It's a very, it's very, very much of a butterfly effect when you think about it like that. Um, and then I think other things to consider as well, um, which are important, is kind of ethical and faith considerations as well. Um, so, you know, when it comes to kind of prior um, religious beliefs and, you know, it's important to make sure that, um, and the NHS has done many community campaigns on this to engage faith leaders and to try and dispel myths and to assure that um, assure individual communities that their beliefs are being actively respected. And of course, you know, anyone can say no if they don't want to. Um, but ensuring that, you know, things are being treated and um, things are being done with uh, the utmost respect and dignity and that patients um, don't feel about uh, patients don't feel you know pressured into making a decision, or they think oh, or they uh, or if there are myths going around that might make them feel uncomfortable, trying to d dispel those ideas. And then when we come to kind of like systemic challenges, I think those are sometimes things that can often cut deeper than ethics. So one of the things I mentioned was that only a small subset of hospital deaths um, actually qualify for for donation. Um, and so advances in ICU care have not really resolved this bottleneck. But also only uh, there's only a couple of hospitals, no, I say couple, but the, there are only some hospitals which are actually able to perform these um, transplants in the, in the first place. And so it might be that people who live closer to these hospitals have a better priority. Um, and also it might mean that there may be um, potential incidents or problems that happen which um, could have ended up as a potential organ donor. However, due to the inadequate facilities of the hospital or whatever it might be, and we were unable to translate that across. Public awareness also vary, uh, varies a lot. Um, and like what I said, um, the misinformation, I think, is still a very, very important um, thing to try and tackle uh, in regards to um, like religious views and what donation means in that regard. And I think the other thing that's important is in tackling this misinformation, which I'll come on to in just a second, is having these kind of honest, direct conversations between families and healthcare professional, professionals. And, you know, even though we have over 28 million UK citizens registered as donors, um, these still, you know, these ongoing increases in waiting times and overall demand, especially as we're living longer um, and, you know, as we have an aging population, means that medical infrastructure and communication are still just lagging a little bit behind. Okay, so tackling barriers and building solutions. So how can we overcome this? So like I said, I think one of the things that's really important is that we need a multi-layered approach. We need one that, you know, talks about compassion, one that discusses education, one that talks about the science behind it as well. So, you know, every person should be encouraged to not just register their wishes, but also to clearly communicate with their families, right? Uh, anyone can opt in or opt out. Um, but, you know, it's important to you know speak with the people around you, speak with your loved ones. And the evidence shows that family support is the most reliable way to convert intended consent into real action. And so perhaps, you know, last year, for example, there's 173 potential um, uh, 
people who overrode their whose um, organs were not donated could have saved more lives. You know, there were, there were potential lives that were um, risked there because we didn't have these conversations. And, you know, secondly, we must go, uh, we must ensure that when we are having these conversations that we include, you know, the right um, people and that we're targeting all different levels. So whether that be starting with schools, primary schools, secondary schools, religious groups, community leaders, and they should be equipped with tailored resources to foster open discussion. So healthcare professionals um, need training not only in kind of like their medical aspect and their medical field, but also in ethics and sensitive communication because it's important. And also, like I said, the NHS must stay committed. Um, so it's not just about, you know, clinical success, you know, not just about numbers, X people saved X organs, but remember, support families across their donation. So once they agree to a donation, it's not just that. It's, you know, recognising their emotional reality, honouring their wishes in practice, not just on paper, and continuing to support them and update them. And I think, in conclusion, organ donation in the NHS reflects more than, you know, science or law. I think it's a mirror of our values and our ability to build trust in these really, really difficult times. Um, and by combining medical expertise, ethical clarity and kindness at the end of the day, we will be able to move closer to a future where every potential donor is honoured, every recipient has hope and every, every family's voice is truly, truly heard. And I think that that is ultimately um, what we should be striving to achieve um, and what we can achieve um, with uh, our, kind of, you know, with our, with our NHS, with, with all the knowledge that we have uh, and with all of our capabilities. So I hope that this video was helpful. Um, I hope that you guys have taken away something from it. Please do let me know what you'd like to see next um, and I will catch you all in the next video.